itself. The first thing I wanted to ask you is uh, about the the series of books was written by Kate London that the tower is based on. Um, did you get a chance to speak with Kate about her experiences in the police force and kind of what her vision of Sarah was? I did. I absolutely did. Yes, I spent a, a good while on the phone to her um, once the job was confirmed to, to have gone my way. And yeah, I spoke to her at length about her time as a detective in London, about, you know, trying to glean what it's really like because we only ever see sort of police dramas and cop dramas and what it's like to be a detective on tv but like the real sort of the real life sort of beat and hustle of it and uh, and you know the things she saw and sort of how typical would it be for someone like Sarah to have seen what she sees and um yeah sort of the the the, the, the sort of the the minutiae and the nitty-gritty of policing you know the protocol and the red tape that police are trying to navigate the whole time whilst trying to save lives and keep people safe you know so it was really fascinating to talk to her um about it so yeah and I but I didn't read the books because um Patrick did such a good job of like um I guess adapting them that they were so similar and so different that I sort of began to get confused is that the book or is that the script or is it do I know that or do I not know that so I just said to Jim Loach in the end like can we just I, I'm not going to read them but you tell me anything necessary for me to use or need that I might need or might find useful and so he told me a few things about Sarah's character and her relationship with her parents and um her personal life a bit and sort of certain things that have happened to her that kind of I had in the back of my mind but didn't really feed into the script or the storyline per se so yeah um, and you've done a, such a variety of things recently. You've got Game of Thrones, you've got Upstart Crow, which I'm a huge star, uh, fan of, by oh, the way. Thanks. I um, love that show so much. It's so great. Um, and then you've done like Pinter on stage and things like that. What was it about Sarah that kind of spoke to you and that connected with you? I suppose her sort of directness and her moral compass being sort of so straight and her sort of the black and white way she sees things. Like I kind of relate to that. I'm a bit of a goody two shoes and I'm a bit sort of down the line and this is what we've been taught so this is how we should police you know and, and so I, I related to that sort of dogma in her that, that that specific sort of attitude in her and um also like I just love police dramas and I've always wanted to play a detective lead and you know with Patrick Harbinson as the writer and these great books it was sort of a it felt like a gift to to be offered the part um so yeah I think I related to it and I also related to her being pretty wedded to her work, you know, a bit of a workaholic, you know, she really loves her job and she really thrives off it. And, um, you know, as I do my work and so very dedicated to her cause. Um, yeah, so I, I like a lot of things about her, I suppose, and also found her a bit curious and detached, which is not so much me, but it was quite nice to play. So yeah, it was a, a lot to appeal to me about, about the job, I was very, pleased when they said it was mine. Well, you mentioned loving uh, police dramas um, and uh, British television in general has a very strong history of especially strong female leads in series like that. Uh, you have Jane Tennyson, you have more recently Vera Stanhope and Ellie Miller. What is it intimidating to kind of join that group of women, do you think? Or was it kind of a, a boost almost to be a part of it? I hadn't even considered it being intimidating, like more of an honor, I suppose, to, to sort of, to to be deemed capable of playing a detective in the first place and also to be you know yeah keeping such good company like that like yeah I think I think that sort of British yeah. crime dramas are such a staple of our tv consumption over here it really is yeah, yeah it was nice to be part of that collection and to have been received well over here was you know a relief I think I think I would have been very upset if it had gone like a bit of a turkey you know but <laughs> very pleased that the reviews were good and people seemed to like it so yeah Sorry, um, adjusting the baby as you can see no no problem that's that's <laughs> impressive i can barely focus uh but focusing on multiple things that's yeah i'm impressed <laughs> Um, you mentioned earlier too about Sarah's um kind of strong sense of justice and her moral compass um and she does kind of stand out in the series too because this, the series is very nuanced and has a lot of great nothing is really straightforward yeah. how do you think she kind of uh keeps that moral compass in the face of of all that she sees um well yeah first of all just to address what you said like i think that's a great thing about the series is that like you don't really come down on anyone's side because everyone's mm -hmm. got a point which i think i loved i love that about the script that like i can see she's got a point i can see she's got a point 
but that's me Gemma seeing that but I think Sarah probably doesn't see that anyone's got a point like you know yeah. she's, she's down the line this is the way we've been trained and anything else is is outside of protocol and therefore not acceptable to her um and in my answering I've forgotten the original question <laughs> <laughs> it was just kind of given everything she sees and the the nuance of everything how do you think she's able to hold on to that kind of that really clear sense of justice and right and wrong well I think I just think anyone who has that sort of internal dogma I suppose is not going to be shakable I think a lot of you know she's not easily influenced she's not someone who's a follower she's a leader and I think you know just related to myself like I can be pretty like, well, I'm right and you're wrong <laughs> because I'm normally right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm joking, I rarely am. But um, <laughs> yeah, I think I think someone's own personal sort of idea about themselves and where they sit is, can be so deep rooted sometimes. There's absolutely no problem in sitting with your authority on a, on a subject. So yeah, I don't. I think she she really holds her own. And in a in a world where she's sort of you know her relationship has been used against her, things are weaponized, aren't they? Her her lack of achievement in her career or why she's not sort of climbed and, and, you know, her boss sort of picks over certain things about her personal life, which he wouldn't do a man, but she sort of takes it on her stride and sort of does have a few sort of quips and comebacks and doesn't let it, you know, it, she lets it all just wash off a duck's back. Um, so yeah, I just think her personality type is very much A to B and she doesn't really get shaken by the side roads, you know, she'll acknowledge them, but she's got a job to do. I think that's the, the thing that she's, ultimately therefore is is she's married to her job isn't she exactly is. we and you mentioned her boss there and I think that's a really relatable piece of Sarah as I think especially as women a lot of us who have had bosses like that maybe at some point in our career yeah have you ever um not necessarily had a boss like that but um been given pieces of advice or a specific piece of advice that you've found really handy to kind of make your way in the industry in that way when you come up against unsupportive people like that? Um, I can't think of any specific example, but I, what I tend to do is just separate myself from any kind of, if I spot a, a cloud in the room, I'm not gonna go and stand under it. So I feel like largely I've been very fortunate in my career that I've come across really great people and worked with really you know, positive um, people um, who just wanna get the job done as best possible and, and stuff. Um, but I think if I have come across people who aren't really the kind of people who are going to support or feed the thing in a positive way, I just stay away. Um, that would be my advice. Don't engage with it, you know, don't engage with it. You know, everyone's got their road, stay on yours. I really like that visual of the cloud. Actually, that's a really good, just don't go into that corner. You don't need to go there. Yeah. I'm inspired. I just came up with it. Yeah, that is brilliant. You can so write that down. It's going to be Gemma Whelan and Nietzsche quoted. <laughs> it absolutely will. It's that good. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> um, you also talked about um, just, well, we talked about her boss, but she does obviously come in contact with a lot of other officers, particularly the character, uh, Jimmy's character and Emmett Scanlon's character, yeah, and yeah. Tahira's character. And they yeah. all have very different relationships can you talk a bit about the kind of interpersonal relationship she has with those other officers yeah I think with Jimmy's character Steve like she, that's her sort of you know that's her that's home for her that's where they feel like they're very connected they're, they're bonded over their work they work really well together they're really um accepting of one of those sort of idiosyncrasies and they they just work really well together um I think certainly Emmett's character is just I found it so hard to work to, as Gemma to listen to some of his lines. I found it yeah. so unbearable. I'm like, oh God, I can't believe I have to hear this in the, in, you know, in 2021. Yeah. But you know, it, it served a purpose to sort of paint him as the villain, I suppose. And, and Sarah holds her own against him um, as well as with um, Carl's character, Bailey, you know, she, mm -hmm. she handles him. She handles him. I love the line where she says, when he offers her a job at the end of episode three and she just says, um, that she's moving on to homicide and then she says you know thanks a lot I've learned a lot from you it's uh, yeah. I thought it was such a great you know a great line because there's obviously the undertones is saying something else or saying exactly that but like I've learned a lot about what not yeah. to do basically yeah exactly not in a good way but yeah exactly <laughs> yeah so she handles him and she's got the she's always had the upper hand I think she doesn't care 
Like, I think she sees these men as, you know, not worth bothering with. Like mm -hmm. they've, got their, they've got their shit, but she's gonna get on with her job. And she's, she's not got time to address that gaslighting today, thanks. But I, I, hear, I see it, you know, in good time, I'll, I'll come back with a quip. <laughs> then, yeah. He does seem like the kind of boss where you'd go home and then think of the good things you should have said. And what I should have said, what I should have said, yeah. but at least you did get the last word with him in the last scene. Yeah, I did clap during that part too. Relief. It, was just, a relief. it was really satisfying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was helpful to have that because I think a lot of women are being like, what the fuck, you're not a doorman. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. a, unfortunately, it's still pretty common. So to hear that. So, yeah, unfortunately so. Well, men have got a lot to teach us, haven't they? Because we- Yeah, we, so, we, so we much. Yeah. <laughs> and I like that he- he got it. It didn't fly over his head. He mm. knew exactly yeah. what she yeah. was saying and why she was saying yeah. it. Yeah, it was great. It was great. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. is there a, a particular scene? Um, there's so many tense scenes, especially with with uh, Emmett's character, that kind of stuck with you after you stopped filming. That you were just like, that really. That's what my job is about. That's that's kind of nailed it. One of those kind of scenes. Um, I think at the top of the stairs when he says, when we've been in the mortuary and um, the wife of Nick Holder's character of, um, oh, it's escaped me now. Anyway, the wife of, of the <laughs> dead cop, forgive me, we can blame yeah. the baby. Um, <laughs> I'll think of it afterwards. Yeah, of course. Um, Hadley, of course it's Hadley. Yeah. Um, the wife of Hadley, she's been brought into a identify his body and then we leave the mortuary and I'm just observing. And then I have a conversation with him at the top of the stairs. And he says something like, he just says it in such a patronizing way. All of his lines are so patronizing, so horrible. And she's just got to hold her own and go after what she needs to go after and not get involved in it. But um, that one was really like, that left a sticky feeling afterwards. I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> anyway. Emmett is a really great guy. Let's have, let's, <laughs> I was misquoted last time. Where, like he says, Gemma Whelan addresses the difficulty of working with Scanlon or something. It's like, <laughs> it was purely like his character. No, was, yeah. yeah. If it's you've seen the show, character. you know yeah. I'm referring to his character. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it has to be. Exactly. Yeah. The, well, and you talked earlier about um, some of the information that Patrick passed along to you about Sarah and her, kind of her background. Is there anything that, if given a chance, you'd like to delve into more about her? Yeah, well, um, she's sort of estranged from her parents because, um, well, for one reason or another, which we may or may not find out, read the books. <laughs> there is, there is one. Ooh. Um, but also she um, she has a sister who died. Okay. And so I think that sort of informs quite a lot of her dogmatic behavior and her sort of tunnel vision. You know, she sort of tends to block things out and, and not get too emotional about things because she's been through something very painful, you know, and also being estranged from her parents, she's quite alone. Um, and so, yeah, those are quite interesting things to know about her, I think, that could be further explored. Um, and yeah, why she's estranged from her parents could be interesting. And a little bit more about, you know, who is, who's Angie and like, who's that, you know, there's sort of alluded to this um, ex-girlfriend who now has a baby. Um, but yeah. I guess those are quite interesting things that, that Jim told me about her. Particularly the sister passing away, actually. That's really informative in terms of how someone functions, isn't it? I suppose, mm -hmm. a loss like that. But yeah. And can kind of relate to, or has that empathy for mm. the people that she's, she's working yeah. for. Because she really does see the, being a police officer, she, she talks about so many times about how that kind of higher standard, the standard they have to set yeah. for, for everyone. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know how her sister died, but maybe she died, you know, and it was a police matter. I don't, I really don't know. And, mm -hmm. you know, therefore she would be so by the book to make sure that no stone is left unturned and no protocol is broken. So it's, if there's a conviction, then it's perfect. I yeah, suppose. there's nothing that can be kind of thrown out or that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, one other thing I thought of while I was watching was that you did film it during COVID, I believe. Yeah. Um, and I wondered if that, uh, obviously that comes with its own layer of difficulty, but when you're playing a character who kind of holds herself slightly apart from everyone, does that actually help a little bit when you're, where, when you're in those slightly different circumstances or is it just uh, business as usual? It felt like just business as usual, actually. We were, we were sort of given, we were, we were supposed to be in bubbles. So Jimmy and I were in a bubble and I think some of the other team were in a bubble and like, but it sort of ended up that we only had one green room in the end. So it's just like, well, you go that side of the room and we'll be able to <laughs> all speak and we were tested twice a week and we wore masks 
And it's actually the only job I've worked on this year where there hasn't been a case. Oh, wow. Remarkable, because everything else I did, Gentleman Jack, and um, I'm just doing something at the moment called D.I. Ray, everything has had a case or two or three. And so the COVID supervisor on the tower was so dogmatic and so, um, what's the word? He was just so on us all the time to the point of annoyance, which he knew, but he kept us safe, you know? So um, we didn't have one case. We were incredibly grateful to them that, that we managed to get through the whole seven weeks without having to stop. Cause you know, it's a full 10 day stop and- Exactly, yeah. Everything was affected. So we were very fortunate there. So yeah, but it didn't feel too like I had to separate myself. No, it felt like I was actually really part of a really nice team and I wanted to- Oh, nice. Okay. Um, <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's good to hear because I always think of it slightly as you might have to be in your own bubbles and then it doesn't have that same com camaraderie that I feel like a set can yeah, offer. No, it does. I think most, most sets have had a great camaraderie because we've all been wearing masks and we've all been, you know, sort of respectful of, you know, but, you know, everyone has to go into the makeup truck at some point and, you know, you catch up there, you catch up in the green room. Yeah, there were, there was still plenty of camaraderie to be had, which is nice because that would be sort of a third of the job ruined, wouldn't it? It's so fun to be part of that team, that the, the instant family that is filming. Exactly. Yeah. Seems like you'd yeah. be missing out on a part of yeah, yeah, the whole yeah. thing if you weren't able yeah. to do that. Yeah. Um, and then uh, just my last question was in terms of, uh, you, uh, you talked about being a fan of British Mysteries, but is there one that you kind of go back to a lot or a favorite that you kind of rewatch or binge when you kind of like a comfort, what's, what's kind of a comfort series like that? Do you have any or are you strictly new content all the time? No, I'm Murder, She Wrote and Columbo every time. <laughs> So I not even British Columbo. mystery, but America, you're straight for the American mysteries. Yeah, but, but um, Murder, She Wrote and Columbo, I just love them every time. They just don't disappoint. They're, yeah, they don't uh, actually, yeah. they hold up really well too. They hold up really well yeah. and they're really comforting. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, those two for sure spring to mind immediately. Um, I couldn't really, I wouldn't really watch, like I could rewatch them over and over where I wouldn't really rewatch, I don't know, the more recent ones. Maybe in time to come, but like so that those long series are just so comforting, aren't they? Comforting. Yeah. Well, there's something about the sort of um, the grandma and the avuncular, isn't there, about those two that's just mm. so comforting. So, yeah. Yeah, they come kind of with built in comfort. Yeah. It's not yeah. even the show, it's just the initial characters have that comfort level exactly. with them. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, that makes uh, that makes a lot of sense. Actually, I didn't think of that. I was thinking of along for us on this side, kind of of the pond. It's the British series that we go back to all the what time, watch, like Inspector Morse and things like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. The, yeah. Inspector Morse is probably the one I can think of that gets kind of mentioned the most. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it's the other way around. Sure. Yeah, but something sort of so obvious and staged about there's something so dramatic about Columbo and Murder She Wrote. I just, yeah just love them and the stings and the camera angles and the, the like the the his motto or not the motto I forget the word that you but the kind of like oh and another thing how yeah, he always one, one more thing one yeah. more thing yeah uh, and you always know what's going to come so I think I had that line in this I think I said just one more thing to Arif in the car park and I said this is my Colombo moment <laughs> so don't waste it don't waste it but <laughs> you know you've made it when you have that Colombo moment yeah just one more thing yeah make it your own that's fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much, you're, Emma. Thank you. Also, I mean, you're juggling, literally juggling <laughs> at the moment. That's very, very much appreciated. I, I was saying to Maddie, like, is this going to be broadcast? Because I haven't got any makeup on and I've got a baby in my arms. And she's like, if you don't mind, I don't mind. I'm like, well, you find me as you get me. And that's yeah. fine. I think that's probably I think, a good message to send now, isn't it? I was going to say, I feel like that's a very, very good message to send these days. And so many people are doing that anyway, juggling so many things at home. So... I think it's also very relatable. 